When I think about genes and the environment, I often think about William Shakespeare, because Shakespeare wrote a play called The Tempest, and uh, the plot of this play involves a shipwreck on an island, um, and on this island there lives a little devil whose name is Caliban. And the people who are shipwrecked try to be kind to this uh, little devil, um, and he turns out to be completely awful. He won't co co cooperate with them, he won't help them, he's just a nuisance. And in great exasperation, one of them says to Caliban, on thy foul nature, nurture will never stick. In other words, you were born so awful that nothing we can do uh, to change your environment will make you better. And that's a very common fallacy when we're talking about genetics, the nature-nurture controversy. Um, not many people know that the nature-nurture phrase comes from Shakespeare. And Francis Galton, um, who was in some senses the founder of human genetics, was completely convinced, absolutely convinced, as was almost everybody else, that everything was in your nature, the way you were born. Okay, and he 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 did. He was a, he was an outstandingly good scientist. He uh, he made mistakes, but all scientists do. He wrote a book called Hereditary Genius, in which he pointed out that, for example, if your father had been a judge and his father had been a judge and his father had been a judge, it was quite likely that you'd be a judge. But he went further than that. He went up to Newcastle on Tyne, which is on a big river where people used to have rowing races and he found indeed that people who were champion rowers, their fathers tends to be a champion rower, their grandfathers did and their great grandfathers did and he did this for various attributes and he found this happened again and again and to this, to, for him, this proved that everything was in your nature, in your biology and that nothing you could do to change the environment would make any difference. Now, of course, he was completely wrong there. Okay, one of the things which is absolutely passed down from one generation to the next, often for many generations, is money. Uh, most people who are millionaires in the modern world are millionaires because their parents were millionaires. That isn't true of everybody um, in this technological age, but it's been true for a long, long time. And there's no genes for money. So the mere uh, the mere existence of a hereditary pattern is a very weak insight to whether something's genetic or not. But many people still don't see that. If you type into Google the words, um, scientists find the gene for, you get, last time I did it, something like 63,000 hits, okay? Um, and given there's only 23,000 genes, that's quite impressive. Uh, but they're silly. Scientists find the gene for language. Scientists find the gene for unhappiness. Scientists find the gene for musicality. Scientists find the genes for height. All these things. But the most dangerous word in the science of genetics is the gene for something. Okay? Because genes are just boring bits of DNA. Um, they work in an environment. And without the environment, they wouldn't be doing anything. And that's the extraordinary thing about knowing a certain amount about genetics. For the public, that makes the environment seem less important. For geneticists, it makes them seem more important. I often talk about a classic example of this, which is cat genetics. I have many examples from cat genetics. And one of them has to do with black cats and white cats. Now, we all know about black cats and we know about white cats. Charles Darwin, actually, found something interesting about white cats, that all blue-eyed white cats are deaf. Um, uh, Darwin found that. And the reason for that is that white cats cannot make the pigment that's called melanin. And that's the pigment which we've all got, uh, which is if you've got dark hair, it's got melanin in it. If you've got dark skin, you've got melanin in it. But you've also, it's also in your brain, in your ears, and various other places. So a black cat can make melanin in a kind of production line, a biochemical production line, which starts with simple chemicals and puts them together to make this complicated pigment. Okay? If one of the machines in that production line has broken down, um, and it, the machinery will go up to that broken point and then go you'll know further and you'll have a white cat. Okay? So that's simple. But sometimes what happens is that the machine hasn't broken down, it's just been slightly damaged, so it doesn't work very well. And then you get some rather strange patterns in cats. The one I'll talk about is called the Siamese cat. I don't know what, what you call it in Russian, um, but it's a cat 
which has got a black nose, ears and tail. And if it's a male cat, it's got black testicles as well. Okay. Um, and the Siamese cat is a genetic mutation. It's a change in the DNA, in the genes. We know exactly what's gone wrong. We know where it's gone wrong. We know the exact DNA base in the DNA chain. We know exactly what's gone wrong there. If we do breeding experiments with other cats, the pattern follows exactly the rules that Mendel found with peas. So it's genetic. I'm very, very happy to accept that. It's certainly genetic. It's certainly true. But, crucially, it's also environmental. Because the reason the cat has got that strange pattern is that the enzyme that does the job of making melanin can do its job well in the cold parts of the cat's body, where there's less spare energy running around and bashing the biochemical process, but it does the job much less well in the warm parts of the cat's body. That's the main body mass, which is one or two degrees warmer, more than the, than the nose, the ears, and the tail, and the testicles, which of course are both literally and metaphorically the coolest part of any male body. They're black as a result. And if you want to make a dark-coloured Siamese cat, you can do it by breeding for many generations from dark-coloured Siamese cats. Or you can take a Siamese kitten and you can keep it in a cold room and it'll be much darker. If you want to make a light-coloured Siamese cat, you can take a Siamese kitten and keep it in a warm room and it'll be much lighter. If you want a very expensive black cat, take a Siamese kitten and keep it in a refrigerator and it'll be a black cat. So that the Siamese characteristic is absolutely genetic but also absolutely environmental. And the two are working together. And that happens again and again and again. And we can see it happening in a dramatic way in our own lifetimes. Um, when I was uh, uh, born, which was 75 years ago, uh, a depressing but true fact, um, I was born at the end of the Second World War, and then, after the war, there weren't any real famines, but there were certain food shortages, and there were what we call rationing. Um, they were, of course, much worse in Russia than they were in uh, Western Europe, much worse in Germany too. Uh, um, but uh, people were forced to eat a very simple diet. And in retrospect, it was a very healthy diet. Um, very little sugar, um, you know, very few cakes and so on, no, almost no butter, all this kind of thing. And so people were generally rather thin. Since then, things have changed dramatically. Um, uh, in, the, in, in those days, and indeed in the 19th century, and indeed in Russia in the 19th century, if you read Tolstoy and so on, it turns out that one of the defining characters of the, of the ruling class, the rich, um, the, uh, the, uh, were that they were fat. The peasants were starving. They were thin. And the same was true here in, here in Britain. If you read Charles Dickens, many of his, uh, of his rich characters in London of the 19th century, they wore top hats and they had cigars and they were obese. The poor people were, the poor people were thin. We've now seen an astonishing reversal of that. Uh, when I give lectures of this to my UCL students here, um, I look at them, and they're a highly intelligent and very middle-class group, and to a person, I don't think there's a fat person in the class. But if I go to a working-class part of London, obesity is a big problem. In America, it's a major problem. Life expectancy in the United States is dropping fast. And the reason for that is, um, is uh, obesity. Why is there obesity? Because food has basically become free. In the 1930s in America, it took a working, working man, and it would have been a man, more than half his working week, uh, to get enough money to buy food for himself, his wife, and two children. Now it takes him, on average, less than a day to do that, as long as he buys cheap, nasty, sugary, fatty food. So that food is now everywhere, universally available, and so people eat that food and they get fat. And in fact, we know a lot about the genetics behind that. There, are strong, there is strong evidence, very strong evidence, that the individuals with particular genes, if they eat a lot of food, become fat. But those genes only ever manifest their effects in a place where food is cheap. It's a Siamese cat phenomenon. If there's no food, it doesn't matter if you've got genes that make you fat, because you're not going to get enough food. Um, but the effect is big, and these genes have a very surprising place where they work. They don't work in the intestine or the liver to change your metabolism, or most of them don't. Um, instead, they work in your brain. They're nearly all of them are appetite genes. We have all kinds of hormones 
that, uh, that uh, change our feelings of hunger. Insulin actually is one. In fact, the first hormone ever found, I have to put an advertisement again in for University College London, was found here, just about 200 yards away down there, and that was actually a hormone called ghrelin, which was an appetite hormone discovered in 1903. Okay? Um, and we all know the feeling of hunger. We're hungry. So we go to McDonald's, either in Paris or London or Moscow, and we buy, we buy some junk food and we eat it. I don't eat it, and I bet you don't either. But people eat it and they say, oh, that was nice, wasn't it? And I think, oh, God, not for me, thanks. But you don't then go again and buy another uh, cheeseburger and another milkshake or a third one because you have other hormones that come in and say, you've eaten enough. These are what we call satiety hormones. Stop eating. You've got hunger hormones and stop eating hormones, okay? Occasionally, very occasionally, people are born who don't make these hormones. Uh, they, so they're always hungry. There's one of them that's called leptin, and one birth in 50,000 or 100,000 is of children who are born with no leptin. And so as babies, they're always hungry. And they're not just pretending they're hungry, they are screamingly hungry. And so, of course, they scream and they yell and make a fuss. And their parents, of course, are very upset by this, so they give them too much food and they become morbidly obese. Um, now, we, fortunately, we can actually treat this with injections of leptin. But that's the nature-nurture thing. Uh, these genes for obesity, or not obesity, these hunger genes, have been around since humans evolved. But they've only become a problem in the last 20 or 30 years, when food has become free, effectively. So that's nature and nurture working together. And there's a second subtlety, which people really don't like to think about, which is that these genes work in your mind, okay? Um, and they, work, they definitely work in your mind. And people find that very disquieting, that your appetites are changed by your DNA. Well, I say, well, it's a hormone. There's another hormone that shows the nature-nurture thing very well and works in your mind, and that's testosterone. That's the, that's the hormone, of course, that makes us men the wonderful creatures that we are. Women have it too, in much smaller doses. But that's why some elderly women grow moustaches as they grow old. Um, women have a little bit, but men have a lot more. And testosterone is, a not, is nasty stuff. It makes, it makes men um, uh, live shorter lives. It makes them much more liable to infectious disease because testosterone suppresses the immune system. And it makes them much more likely to get involved in, in being murdered. Okay, um, uh, so tes testosterone changes your behavior. And we know very well the way it does it. We know all the, a lot about the biochemistry. Bodybuilders, for example, who um, use testosterone to get big muscles, they tend to die for male reasons. They're murdered, they die in car crashes, they commit suicide, that kind of thing. So testosterone works on your, on your mind. But one of the things it definitely does is to, uh, is to change your propensity for violent behavior. All over the world, men murder at 10 times the rate of women. The murder rate in Britain is fairly low. It's not as low as in Singapore. The murder rate in, in Colombia, in South America, is 100 times the murder rate in Singapore. The murder rate in the United States is five times the rate uh, of the murder rate in Britain. Okay. Now, the testosterone is exactly the same in both places. But in Colombia, there are drugs, there are gangs, there are weapons, there's poverty, there's unemployment, there's violence, and this puts part of the population at genetic risk. They're known as men. They have genes that put them at risk of murder of, um, if they're placed in a murderous environment. If you want to get rid of murder, you do what the people in Singapore and in Britain have done. You get rid of guns. You cannot get a gun in this country, a pistol, it's impossible. Ditto in Singapore. You try to improve uh, living conditions, you try to reduce uh, unemployment, and all this works. So you're solving a genetic problem by changing the environment. And that probably is the take-home most important message you can take from the modern world of human genetics. <laughs>